I'm apologies if I keep there is mozzies out in force after all this rain and a little bit of sunshine. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, back out here at the community garden, which is so lovely. There is everything has just burst it with this rain and then the sun and the rain and sun we've been getting a really good growing season um if you i don't know if you've seen how many weeds are growing in your garden as well not just, just the good plants um but what we're going to be talking about today is companion planting now um companion planting is quite important it's kind of the way that nature does it like if you have a, if you walk through the forest if you walk through like go on a bush walk it doesn't matter where you are you basically don't find any place that is a single plant species. There are very few exceptions of that, if there's very cold, cold places and things like that. But in general, it's variety. And variety is key for ecosystems. Um, different, um, different insects require different pl plants. They have different um, nutrient requirements from the, so they get different stuff from the soil so they can coexist really nicely um, and it gives variety to um, yeah to the surrounds if one has a bad year for some reason if the weather conditions aren't great for that species then another species is going to you know pop up and take this take the place and then when you know when this that cycle's finished the other plants will come back so it's just like to and fro and companion planting um, gets us into the best of of this sort of natural world um, and it's basically planting different types of plants together that's the the crux of it <laughs> the crux of it um, and the the thing is that some um, some plants assist each other and some plants compete with each other so you can kind of think about um, companion planting like a big crowd of people in a big crowd of people there are some people that you'll naturally click with you'll you know be you'll build each other up and you know you you have fun with them and there's other people that are really going to grate on you <laughs> probably not going to want to be their friends and you're pretty happy if you're at the furthest end of the field from them so companion planting is exactly the same so when we plant um plants that like each other or like could go well together as companion plants they assist each other in different ways um, they might deter pests from each other they might improve the growth enhance the flavor if we're looking at food um, they attract beneficial insects like the hover flies there's tons of hover flies around here as well not just the mozzies um, they might fix nitrogen into the soil so another um, plant can take that up they might um, disrupt um, patterns of um, disease um, or they can also um, do uh, help with um, with growth and, and things like that um, so yeah just as I said is there's, there's good neighbors and there's bad neighbors so just as some um, plants like fix nitrogen so that others can take it up if you're putting two plants next to each other that are sucking the nitrogen out of your soil your soil is going to be become depleted and those plants are kind of going to strangle each other. Um, and there's, um, yeah, so some plants just really don't like each other and we want to keep them far away <laughs> from each other if possible. Um, so some of the other benefits of um, companion planting is pest control. And that's a real big one um, for me because I don't want to be spraying my, especially my vegetables with whole, a whole heap of chemicals um, that we don't want to be ingesting them. We get enough toxins from other places. We don't need to be spraying them on our vegetables as well. Um, better growth. So if you can have a tomato plant that grows better, you're going to need less of them and you're going to get nicer fruit, more plump, like large fruit um, and more like in, um, an enhanced flavor in your, your fruit as well. They, what they can also do is balance the, the nutrients, as I said, like nitrogen um, in the soil um, and because different plants require different nutrients and your, your three big ones, NPK, nitrogen, potassium, and um, uh, um, nitrogen and phosphorus. <laughs> I'm like, P is not potassium, it's K. Um, and phosphorus. So, um, and they take different things, need different amounts of soil. And if you're on last week, we talked a little bit about pH. Ah, mozzy. Um, and um, when the pH is really alkaline, some of these, um, some of the nutrients are actually kind of locked up in the soil. Even if they're there, the plant, plants can't access them. So again, you know, if you've got plants that have different requirements, some of them may need a more alkaline soil. Some of them may need like blueberries and hydrangeas need a more acidic soil. The other thing when you have different plants in the soil is that 
bugs in the soil, all of our um, micro um, flora, uh, fauna, always all, all like different um, root systems and, and different nutrients and, and all of that. So if you have, it's kind of like if you think about, again, if you think about people, some people live in apartments, some people like houses, some people like townhouses, different bugs like different places to live and the different plants provide those different habitats essentially in the ecosystem. And the other thing is that it actually looks really pretty. <laughs> so when we're companion planting, we don't just have vegetables in a garden. We can have flowers. We can have um, lots of different um, foliage plants or whatever. And so it actually looks pretty cool um, when you have um, a lot of different companion plants around. So one of the things that um, I love to do in my vegetable garden is have plants around that attract bees. So we, we actually have a beehive. So we're pretty good in terms of the bee front. We have a lot of bees around. Um, bees are inherently efficient. I won't say lazy, they're efficient though. So if they know that there is a flower close to the hive, they will go there first and then a the little bit further away and a little bit further away. They won't fly to the best flower if it's five Ks away even though they, they can go that far. They'll, they'll be very efficient. So we, we do have a lot of bees in our front yard, in our veggie garden. Um, but I still like to make sure that they, there's stuff there that they like. Um, you know, the more stuff that there's there in my garden, the more likely they're going to stay in my garden too. And so there's plants that attract bees and most of them are purpley blue, like that purple blue color, things like lavender, Selvia, borage are really good ones um, and they have, uh, the bees just love them. And a little bit of an an anomaly that I found in my garden is that they love brassica flowers. So, and these are bright yellow. So they're typically not on the, the, the spectrum that you'd say that the bees usually like. Things like if you let your broccoli go to seed, if you let, oh, to flower and um, kale um, and even um, uh, Brussels sprouts. And um, I mean, you, if you let the cauliflower go to, to seed, you've missed your opportunity to harvest. So, um, but those ones, that you, your kale and your broccoli, I let them go to flower and the bees just love them. You see like bees all up and down the, the whole stalk. Um, eat, and your herbs as well, things like oregano, um, rosemary, and rosemary is a nice purpley flower. Um, oregano and um, dill, coriander, parsley, all of those guys, they the bees really love and the benefits from having bees in your garden is um one they pollinate all your flowers <laughs> but they also pollinate your vegetables your your uh, or, or your, your fruiting vegetables things like your zucchinis your tomatoes your pumpkins your cucumbers pretty much all of our summer veg vegetables <laughs> are actually fruits so rock melons watermelons all of those um vines as well even um your your beans are a little uh self-pollinating um and and peas um but they do benefit from having the bees around as well so um, having bees in your garden is very beneficial. Um, yeah, but just remember, oh, mozzies, sorry. Um, just remember that the, um, that they need the, the, the plant needs to flower to attract the bees. So if you've got some broccoli that goes a little bit too far, don't just pull it out, leave it there, let it go to flower and um, yeah, and, and the bees will come. Um, oh, some other, I've just got a list. I wrote a list down because I knew I'd forget and I'm just going to read off the list. <laughs> um, so things that, that, that um, the bees really like, we've got borage, lavender um, and um, salvia, thyme, oregano, lemon balm. So they're all like on you in your herb family. The happy wander, wanderer or hardenbergia. And you'll see that it kind of looks like the leaf looks like a gum leaf, but it's a vine and it's got pretty purple through to white flowers, um, depending on the, the variety you've got. And a lot of them are early flowering. So one, mine's pretty much finished flowering um, for the year. And the great thing about that is in those colder months, so as they're coming out of winter, the bees then have something to go to before the, um, the gum trees Oh, I got him. Um, <laughs> um, be, before the gum trees flower, before everything else flowers, the happy wanderer will flower first. So that's a really good one to have. Rosemary sunflowers, they absolutely love sunflowers. Get them in the ground ASAP if you're going to be doing sunflowers. 
um, alyssum, um, baby's breath, um, marigolds, calendula. And the great thing about a lot of these, if you, if you, you know the name, a lot of them are things that not only do the bees love, but we love them too, to making teas for, you know, your herbs and everything like that as well. So um, double benefits there. So in terms of what goes together, um, basically if we're, when we're thinking about food companion planting, most things that go on the plate together go well together in the ground. So if you think about um, like garlic and tomatoes and basil, that's a really nice combination to go together. They go really nicely when we put them in the, on the plate and they go really nicely um, in the ground together. So one thing um, to be aware of, if, if, you, if you have say, the same uh, different plants in the same family, they will generally be competing. So funnily enough, tomatoes and potatoes are um, very closely related. If you really wanted to, you can actually graft a tomato plant onto a potato plant if you want to do some funny experiments. Um, <laughs> however, because they compete for nutrients, they compete competing for the same type of nutrients. If you have um, potatoes in the ground, don't plant tomatoes near them because they're going to be competing and both of them you'll probably get an average crop rather than getting a really good crop out of one of them. Um, if you've got apple trees, what one of the biggest annoyances with apple trees is, a co is called the codling moth. Now the codling moth um, to um, ward off for this season, you really need to get your garlic and onions in the ground by at the latest August, September. If you put them in now, you're probably going to have missed the, the boat with, um, with when the, the caterpillar or the, the slugs, I don't know, no, caterpillars, I guess they are, um, crawl from the ground up the trunk and into your fruit around the leaves and then into your fruit. So what you'll actually see on apples when they're small, even when they're just like the size of um, like large marbles, um, you can see there'll be almost looks like something's drilled into them and there'll be a little like dark brown sand granules just near um, the hole. And that's where the caterpillars actually drilled into your apple and it's going to sit there. The apple will still grow. Um, it's going to sit in the middle and then it, it starts eating it from the inside out. You can still eat these apples. They don't actually do um, a lot of damage in terms of the apple still grows and it still looks good. But when you cut it open, there will be a chunk that is bad. And it's just, it's then you can't just eat that <laughs> the apple. You got to cut them up and stuff. So to ward off these codling moss, garlic, chives, onions, the allium fam uh, family, you got to you plant them in like a fairy ring around the, uh, the apple tree. Um, and if you, you're planting garlic in May, do it then. Just plant them around um, there so then you can harvest your garlic in December and, you, and you're good to go. Um, nasturtiums is another really good one that the, the codling moth just don't like the, the smell or the chemicals that are in it. Um, and so they just, they just don't go near that tree. Don't plant your potatoes around your apple trees. They're just not friends. They don't go together. <laughs> um, so um, they, they compete for the same nutrients in the soil. If we've got some tomatoes, and I know a lot of people um, have been coming and grabbing tomatoes from the community centre here. We've still got some um, more here. Um, so just contact Joanne and you can come down and grab some on a, I'm going to say a Monday and Wednesday. Um, yep. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, they're $5 for three and they've been grown here. I've been um, caring for them over the, the time that we couldn't, have, couldn't be here at the garden. And now they're, they're looking nice and um, healthy. They're quite, you know, quite a good size and they're hard, hardened off, which means they've been outside for a few weeks now. So they're all good to go in the ground as the um, weather warms up. So tomatoes, you can plant with um, garlic, an oregano and basil, that, you know, the classic combo. <laughs> oh, the sun's just moved. And I'm gonna, might have to move my camera. There we go. So you don't get that glare again. Um, and so that, yeah, that's a nice classic combination. Now remember your tomato plants are gonna grow quite large. So even though when you get them, they're only this, this tiny seedling, some of them grow up to 1.8 meters. Your cherry tomatoes are essentially almost like a vine. So you, they grow as tall as you um, and they can be quite large. So make sure you're going to have some adequate space around your tomato that you're, if you're putting basil or garlic or anything around the base of it, they're not just going to get swamped and not get any sunshine. So just, just be aware of that one. 
So the basil, like, um, it repels mosquitoes and flies and things like that. Um, and as, as I said before, don't plant tomatoes with potatoes because they, they're in the same family, they compete for food. Um, but tomatoes are also not great with beetroot for a similar reason. And fennel seems to um, slow down the growth of your tomatoes. So just keep them apart. And when I'm in a part, a few meters is fine. It doesn't have to be like, you know, don't plant fennel in your whole garden if you've got tomatoes um, down the other end. So one of the best companion plants that you'll have in your garden are herbs. Herbs are the health benefit of adding herbs to your food consistently even at small amounts is huge. So if you haven't got fresh herbs in your garden I'd highly recommend grabbing some. Grab your favourites. If you've got dried herbs in the cupboard have a look and a lot of them you can grow here in Melbourne. Things like thyme, marjoram, oregano, um, lemon balm, any, there's so many different types of thyme, by the way. Lemon thyme is another one of my really big favourites. Um, there's pizza thyme as well, which is, has a little bit more of a, um, bit more of a mixed herb flavour, I guess you could say. Um, you've got sage, you've got rosemary, all of these things, they've all got um, essential oils in them and eating those can be really good for you, eating the herbs can be really good for your digestive system and your overall health. That's my little, <laughs> little side note there, but they're also good for your garden. Um, they repel a lot of the, um, like the bad insects and bad bugs and they also attract a lot of the beneficial micro wasps and hoverflies and all of those things um, when they're in flower and bees. A few little tips though, mint, then it's not friends with parsley for starters. Parsley and mint don't go to, <laughs> parsley and thyme go together, but not parsley and mint. Um, and try not to plant mint in any garden. And this is like, if you don't get anything else out of today, don't plant mint in your garden unless you want it to take over. Because <laughs> you might go, oh, that's really nice. The first year I've got a nice, you know, it's gone from this to this. And the next year it's going to take over the whole garden. It puts runners in the ground. It's kind of like buffalo grass. Some of them are really um, a quite aggressive um, in their growth and which is great we get lots out of it but you won't be able to grow anything else there so keep them in pots nice large pots they can be quite you know quite shallow and wide pots if you want um, and yeah mint um, at, at this time of year um, if it hasn't started sprouting back yet chop all the old growth back and it'll just mine's just gone nuts um, in the last couple of weeks with and same here I'm just looking along here along the road where we've got our mint just underneath our vertical wall um, and it's, yeah, lots of mint for tea, for um, in fruit salad. It's really yummy in fruit salad. Um, and um, there's a chalk mint that we've got down here um, that you can grab cuttings from, which is amazing in um, just in hot water. And it's like drinking a, a, a almost like a hot chocolate, a peppermint hot chocolate, um, but just with the herb. So, um, yeah, that's my little, little tip on mint. <laughs> Um, lemon balm is a really beautiful herb. It's got so many good properties um, for us and it goes really well um, in the garden. Again, just be aware. Now this one, the balms, there's lemon and lime balm. They're not as vigorous as mint, but they will start to take over eventually once they get established. So I do have my some of my lemon balm because I love lemon balm. I could just, you know, sleep in it it's amazing it's the best thing um i do have a patch in my garden that i've dedicated to lemon balm and i'm okay with it taking up that nice big space but again if you've only got a small space keep your lemon balm and your lime balm in in pots um and, oh and also it attracts bees it repels mosquitoes um and the, the squash bugs as well um, which can get into your zucchinis and your, the squash family, pumpkins and stuff. Marjoram improves the flavor of a lot of vegetables. Um, it is, again, marjoram and oregano, they're cousins. Um, they are a ground cover. They're not as vigorous as your mint, so you can put them in the garden, but they will spread. So you, And you can just pull them up and um, give them to friends um, as, as nice little gifts as well. Thyme is thyme and the thyme family, lemon thyme, pizza thyme, all of the others are amazing. Um, beautiful family, the bees, the hoverflies, the micro wasps, everyone loves the flowers. So let it go to flower. Don't pull them off. Don't, you know, use the, the leaves in your cooking. Um, and um, they attract all the bees. They don't like competing with other plants though. So they are a little bit 
of a loner. <laughs> um, so they like having their space. Um, lemon thyme is a bit more vigorous than the, the normal thyme. It's got a slightly larger, larger and different leaf too. Um, but they, yeah, they, they kind of like having their own little patch and not competing too much. So don't pack them in too closely. Um, so dill, and this is a really interesting one. Dill, um, for me, dill's a bit of a weed in my garden. It just pops up everywhere because once it's gone to seed, growing conditions here in Melbourne are great. And it'll start, it started popping up. It, it, we don't see much of it over winter, but it started popping up again. Same with coriander. Um, so dill attracts a, a, a tiny micro wasp that actually helps control the, you know, the cabbage white butterfly. Everyone knows the cabbage white butterfly with the big fat green caterpillars that just decimate <laughs> all of your brassicas, not just your cabbages. Well, it ha yeah, so it helps to control the caterpillars of, of the, um, the cabbage white butterfly. So we've got lavender. Lavender, not only is it great for, you know, drying, um, and some are edible, some lavenders are edible, but just make sure that when you're purchasing a lavender plant, make sure that you double check that the, it's one of the edible ones. It repels um, mice and mites. So um, if you have and um, ticks and things like that, if you have chickens, lavender is really good to have around your chickens. Um, and, but it also attracts the bees, the butterflies, the hovercraft, uh, hovercraft. <laughs> <laughs> the hoverflies. <laughs> um, so it attracts all of our beneficial and repels a lot of our um, unwanted little critters that we don't want to. So, and one of the, the great things about lavender, it actually self seeds in this climate. So um, some varieties you'll find are, are, are quite good at self seeding. So you'll actually be able to replicate some of your lavender plants. Um, if you have chickens, wormwood is really, um, a really great companion for your chickens um, and it um, wards off mites again so you just plant it near their coop um, and you can we, if you rub the leaves you can you'll be able to smell it um, just in general day to day our nose is that that um, sensitive to to smell it usually um, but you can smell and smell that and that is what help, um, the oils in it and it helps to um, ward off mites there um, if you've got grapes grab geranium as well they go really well together um, and strawberries and garlic. So strawberries and your allium family don't go well together, nor do they like brassicas. So that's your cabbages and, and all of those sort of things. So um, strawberries, again, they're a bit of a loner. The reason they're a loner is because they're a bit of a gut in terms of nutrients. <laughs> so they like to be well fed. They like to have, to have a lot of nutrients. Um, and um, yeah, they just don't like competing. So just put them alone. I have most of my strawberries. Again, they will do, they will have runners as, as well um, quite often. A lot of my strawberries are actually in pots. So, um, and we've got the, the wall here, which is all strawberries as well. So that's my download <laughs> for, for the moment. Um, but what I'm gonna do is I'm quickly gonna show you some of the companion plants that we have here at the garden. So I'm gonna turn you around. You can hear our resident lorikeets and all sorts of things. They're, they're all here today. Okay. Oh, one thing I didn't mention actually is these guys. They, so you can get white um, pansies and petunias and things. Make sure they're white and they actually, um, the cabbage white butterflies, um, they're very territorial. And when they see these guys, they think there's other butterflies already here. So they won't lay their eggs nearby that. So that's another little tip. Here we've got our chives and I think I show off our chives every week because I just love the chive flowers. They're absolutely beautiful. So this is part of the Allium family. So this is one of the ones you can use um, around the base of your apple trees for codling moth. Now we've got here, we've got sage. So some of our herbs here, our sage, um, it's not, oh, I think it was, well, I'm looking for, here we go. So we've got sage and then we've got, this is lemon thyme. And you can see lemon thyme is quite a bit, the leaves are a bit round, um, a bit rounder than normal thyme and they're a bit um, greener. So a normal thyme, which we did have here somewhere and I can't see it. It's a little bit overgrown. Oh, here we go. You can see and, and the normal thyme has got quite small leaves. They're a little bit grayer as well um, and a little bit more angular. So actually if I put the two together, oh, where is it there? You can see. So they're actually quite, uh, quite different in size um, and they've got quite it's a different flavour. The lemon thyme 
um, ha has a quite a, a, a lemony flavor. It's really good in chicken. And this is what it looks like in flower. So this is what the bees and the hoverflies and all the little micro wasps and everything, they just love these little tiny flowers. Um, so leave it, let it, let it go to flower. This is our lemon balm. Um, and it's not, it hasn't, it's not flowering quite yet um, this year. But this is, yeah, as I said, when, the, when it starts to flower, it's amazing. Here we have coriander flowers. So if you've never seen coriander flower, they're little white petals are all different sizes. And then just down here, if you guys, if anyone cooks with whole coriander, these might look familiar. They're green at the moment, but they'll start to go brown. So you can actually use these in cooking too, once they've dried off. Um, we don't have any quite yet that are at that stage, but that's the, that's the same coriander um, that you get a whole, whole coriander seeds there. Um, where was I going? Oh, the rosemary is finished flowering. I was going to, I don't think that this is the, this is the rosemary. It looks like, yeah, it's pretty much done for flowers this year. You can see all of the old flowers here and then all of the new shoots. Um, and someone, I did see someone was asking, um, yeah, can we come and grab cuttings from, for, for, um, herbs and stuff from the garden? Absolutely. Just give Joanne a call, um, and make sure that someone's here to let you into the garden. So, um, yeah, there's lots of different mints. Um, we've even got a few strawberries left. Um, this one is one of my favorites. This is called an alpine strawberry and this is the size of the strawberry. Can you see that? It's tiny and it tastes like, they taste like lollies. So they're extremely sweet. You can see we've got our tomatoes here, some capsicums and chilies. So there's lots of chilies left. Um, actually, I think there mightn't be any capsicum left, lots of chilies left. Um, yeah, so lots of little bits and pieces that you come down, just talk to Joanne and um, send her an email or give her a call to organize a time. Um, are there any questions? I just sorry. I, I, yep, I Marie has asked, can you repeat what you said about mint and parsley being planted together? What's better beside? So oh. do they go together or not? No. So mint and parsley steer clear of each other. Um, they don't, they seem to compete. Um, they don't like each other so much. I'm just going to go trying to find, it's so sunny today. It's hard, harder to find a spot that doesn't have spider webs and doesn't have bright sun. But yeah, no, um, parsley and mint, not together. Um, just keep your mints in, mint in pots. Now, parsley, if you've ever had parsley self-seed in your garden, you'll know that again, it can go a bit wild. The thing about parsley is you can just pull it out. So you can pull it out at any stage. Um, but yeah, don't, don't put your mint and your parsley together. This is what happens when parsley self seeds. <laughs> so this is all mint, I mean, sorry, all parsley here. So you can't really see much there. So that big, this here is all parsley going to seed and we're just gonna let it go to flower so that the, the bees and everything can have a field day. Um, yeah. Um, okay, so we have a question. Any recommendations for companion planting for fruit trees like your nectarines and your peaches? Yeah, so most fruit trees in general, they don't want a lot of um, friends close by um, in terms of don't put anything really close to their trunk. Um, they get, they can get, you know, no, they don't like to have their toes um, stood on. Um, I don't have a list at the moment. Um, there is a good list in Craig Castry's book of companion planting um, for different things. There's also a group online, um, which I'll send the link to um, Joanne that has a really good companion planting list um, that um, goes, goes through a few more bits and pieces. I just don't have them on me, so I don't wanna give you the wrong, um, <laughs> wrong ones at the moment. Um, okay. Uh, I have a problem with earwigs. They're eating all my seedlings. How do I get rid of them? Yeah, so um, difficultly. <laughs> um, so you can use um, for, for um, slugs and for some reason it works for, it has worked for me in the past with earwigs um, beer traps. 
or oil traps. So you're actually putting a lure of something sweet in there or the, the beer or you can, depending on the what your bugs like, you can use, um, some people use soy sauce or um, honey. So something mixing it with oil and putting it in a container that they, once they get the oil on them there, it's too slippery for them to get out. So um, there's probably um, chemical ways that you can get rid of them as well. I, I just prefer not to use them, uh, chemicals in general. If your seedlings are um, not in the ground as yet, then you can put them on a tray that is then on, so on a pot, uh, so a, tr a tray that's on a pot in water. Um, and so you're not allowing them a path to go from the outside world and up. Does that make sense? Um, yep. Yeah. So um, just, just putting them in a pot, like a, a tray with your seedlings on top, in a, on a pot, in a pool of water so that they can't actually climb up into, into your pots. So basically they have to swim across the water, a bit like an obstacle course, swim across yes. the water and then climb up the pot to get to yep, your seedlings. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And, if you, and again, if you put a slick of oil, like just a, um, some oil on top of that, it'll make them even harder to get. And if they do try, they'll probably drown. <laughs> hmm. I've, I've, I'm going to jump in with one, snails. Snails, yeah. Hmm. So um, snails, I do a few things with for snails. It's one of the few things that I will um, use if I've got a really bad problem, I will use a snail bait. There are some that are um, cat and dog friendly, so you don't have to worry about your pets if you've got pets. Um, the other thing is collecting them um, and giving them to the chickens. Um, and the best time to collect them is at night because that's when they're active. So you can go out with a torch. Um, sometimes I give the girls a torch and go, hey, do you want to go find some, uh, you know, or go on a treasure hunt? <laughs> um, and, um, the, the, and the places that they will hide. Now, if they're getting into your pots, lift up the, the pot and look on the bottom or if you've got lots of pots uh, like little seedling pots and stuff look in between the pots in the dark cracks because that's where they'll be hiding out during the day because they don't want to be in the sun um and then they'll come out at night and and decimate stuff so um yeah the, and the beer traps work really well for slugs um and sometimes snails I, I don't know why i think slugs are more attracted to them than the, than the snails but yeah. um yeah things like that can work too um B said parsley makes a great wine if you have a big crop. <laughs> there you go. I, I yeah. have never had parsley wine. I can't say that. <laughs> That's one I've tried, but yeah, all sorts of things. <laughs> yeah. That sounds cool. Yeah. Um, that's all the questions so far. If anyone else has any more questions that they would like to ask. Rhubarb. Mm. Where's a good place to plant the rhubarb? Rhubarb. So rhubarb's a little bit like strawberries. They love a good, good compost. Um, not too, if they're going to have full sun, it, they need to have full water as well. <laughs> um, so a little bit of shade is quite good. If you have a look at the size, generally for a, a plant, look at the size of, size of the leaf and that gives you a good indication of how much sun it needs. The bigger the leaf, the less full sun it needs. Um, so you think about something like spinach, you put that in full sun, it's going to bolt pretty quickly. Um, if you think of something like thyme that has these tiny little leaves, they can deal with a lot more sun. So rhubarb's got quite large leaves. I'm just going to see if we've got our, how about if our, oh yeah, our rhubarb's over here. It's actually in the sun at the moment, um, but it's under a gum tree usually. So there's our rhubarb there. Um, and um, yeah, so just making sure that you give it a lot of good compost and a lot of good... Um, um, and water over summer so that it has enough to, to uh, um, water to grow those nice big stems. Uh, Suzanne just asked, I transplanted pumpkin seeds, then we had the deluge of rain, lots of wind. What can I do to revive the seedlings? Yeah, so um, it's a tricky one. <laughs> um, so with pumpkins and zucchinis and a lot of those guys with bigger seeds, it is best if you're going to be buying them, I would actually buy seeds and stick them in the ground um, because they don't like to be transplanted. Um, but in now what you can do is you can get an old, um, like a Coke bottle, chop the bottom off and make a mini greenhouse, take the lid off the top so that there's airflow and just put that over for a little, a few days. If it's really sunny, like today, 
maybe just um, take it off or, or make sure there's um, some airflow underneath so it doesn't get too hot. But it will, you know, it'll like a little bit of extra warmth. Um, you can put them over, win uh, over like late afternoon and overnight as well, just to keep that temperature around the plant a bit warmer overnight. Um, yeah, so that's probably the best thing to do for those guys. They do get, um, they can rot with excess water. Um, especially when they're small. So that can be a challenge. Um, there's not a lot to you that you can do if the stem has completely rotted. Um, but gr you can always grab more seeds and um, stick some more seeds in the ground to have a continual crop as well. Cool. Yeah. Um, anyone else got any more questions? So much traffic around. <laughs> oh, I know. Yes, I noticed that yesterday. <laughs> yeah. The birds oh, were still tweeting pretty, pretty well yesterday too, the little parrots. Um, Suzanne said, my leeks rotted with all the rain. Should I build the soil up with sand? Yeah. Um, how uh, I guess the question would be how far like if the outside of it just rotted the couple a couple of um, like leaves around the outside that's that's all good um, my leeks are pretty good just in the ground as such um, you could if you if you feel that they're always having wet feet then yeah you could even if you raise the level of that section of the bed um, for them a little bit that could also work um, they're usually generally pretty hardy in the middle so the, it just might be the yard a couple of leaves have, have rotted um, depending on I should say depending on how what size they are as well yeah okay. oh good well yeah. this is if there's no other questions, I'm going to um, do a little bit of gardening here and get some things in order before we're allowed to have people back. So hopefully that comes soon. And um, then, yeah, we can come here and um, plan out the tomatoes. Next week we're doing tomatoes and basil, I believe. Yes, next week is um, summer veggie support. Summer veggie, so, oh, yes. Yeah. So looking at trellises. Supporting and them and to get the best, get the best results from them. So, yeah. yeah. So Suzanne's just said that her whole leak rotted. Oh, leak. yeah. Um, I, yeah, it's probably in a fairly waterlogged spot then. Um, and giving it, yeah, just raising up that bed a bit. You can do that a couple of ways. If you've got a large pot, um, you can either just make a mound so that the water doesn't sit in that mound. Or if you want, you can get a, a like a pot, chop the bottom off the pot turn it upside down and so then you've got kind of like a cone shape that you can put some extra soil and stuff in there um and yeah so we'll, it's probably a drainage issue rather than um than anything else yeah okay well if there's no more questions today thanks belinda i'm um, glad no that you've got um some nice weather to be there and yes i noticed the mozzies yesterday too so yeah um, we might have to look at a few more companion plants to keep mozzies yes. away <laughs> yes we will this wall needs a few of them <laughs> yes yes so um thank you everyone for joining us um like we said um join us next week we're going to talk about um supporting your summer veggies to get the best out of them um hopefully we get another i think i heard nice weather for next week too so um, yay yeah. But hopefully less mozzies then as well. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but okay. thank you everyone for joining us, and um, we will see you next week. No worries, see you guys. See ya.